Welcome to the Northern Mythology Podcast. I'm Daniel Farrand, co-owner of the company Horns of Odin, and I'm joined, as always, by Dr. Matthias Nordvig. Hello, everybody. This time we're joined by Andrea Heilsko. Uh, Andrea is an author, prominent heathen, uh, a vulva from Denmark, and also an old friend of mine. So welcome to the show, Andrea. Thank you so much. The internet is unstable, but I guess I'm coming through anyways. You are, you are yeah. I think maybe the, there might be a little bit of a mm. a little bit of a lag, but hopefully we okay. can we'll we'll figure that out, I'm sure. Um yeah, so I think these episodes always end up being the funnest for me, or I think some of the best episodes that we do as well, where I mean when it comes to kind of the witchcraft or vulva type stuff i always find them to be so far out of my personal wheelhouse that i i find the episodes to be so interesting and take a genuine interest in learning um kind of a new perspective on things okay so skip bare snack yeah okay <laughs> yes okay i think i'm i'm just gonna talk into the void then here so ask me questions and i'll try and figure out the conversation because it seems my internet is lacking a lot so oh, okay um, so um i mean uh, what dan was saying is that the uh, the subject of like uh witchcraft and being a vulva and those kinds of things are some of the things that um you know, interests him the most because he learns the most from from these kinds of podcasts that we do with the uh, oh, yeah, ritual yeah, yeah. specialists, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, let's start well, I, there. We would love to hear more about that. <laughs> well, I have to say that you being an old friend, having participated in things with me and written about them quite badly in your book, Matthias, <laughs> yeah, makes it quite uh, yeah, you did, didn't you? Uh, but it's it's an interesting topic because I think we've changed all of us. I started out as a reconstructionist and I have, well, wanna be reconstructionist and have completely embraced being uh, more of a revitalist. So things have changed for both of us, I think, for me and Matthias. And it's it's fun to catch up here 20, 20 years later. Where are we now and what are we doing now? So yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing my thoughts with you. Oh, I, I mean, I, I would be a terrible co-host if I didn't ask what Matthias did wrong in his book. <laughs> I, I have to ask. Yeah, I'm also a little. I, I'm. I don't remember mentioning anything about you. Okay, book. but maybe I'm being a bit, a bit. Uh, what is the word in English? I don't know. I think you wrote something about a really awkward ritual in the underbushes where we were screaming. Like oh, that wasn't no 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 that wasn't you that wasn't you that was that, no 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 that was uh, that, okay. well, it could have been no it could have been yeah no ah, okay. yeah. <laughs> we, we did some uh, we did some funny things <laughs> we did yeah no no that was that was an entirely different that was uh all who's blow that was, <laughs> ah, okay. Okay. Don't worry about it. I I, oh, okay, okay. I I haven't sold yeah. you out anywhere. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I did actually write about you though, Matthias, in this book. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Because you actually participated in my initiation that we experimented with, you know, 20 years ago, and we didn't know what the fuck we were doing. We didn't know what a vulva is. We didn't know how to initiate people. It was a time of like great experimentation. So you're in it. You have a little cameo in my book. Oh, cool. I, I hope yeah. it's better than, than what you thought I was writing about you. Oh, yeah. I, I hope it's pure revenge. No, it's, it's <laughs> sweet. sweet. Oh, I love seeing Matthias squirm. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, I, we, we spoke about Volvers before with, uh, with Tanya, but I think we should maybe recap on what traditionally a vulva is and then also kind of in, in a modern sense as well um i guess because every every podcast is somebody's first podcast that they're going to listen to us you know that this might be the one that they start their journey on and then go back through the the back catalog hopefully so yeah i mean and andrea do you want to kind of start with what traditionally a vulva would have been 
Well, I when I'm asked the question, Vulvas are very, very hot in Denmark right now. There's a lot of pop culture going on around the concept of the vulva. The church, the minister of church and culture was actually dressed as a vulva in a, in a public um, PR stunt. So there's a lot of talks about what is a vulva and what does she do? And, and you know, if, if I'm speaking into a main main stream context, I'm comparing her to sort of a witch like at the Nordic sort of a witch, because I'm not a super fan of, of the modern interpretations of the vulva as a, as a um, seer or um, what is the word, Matthias Norman, when you're going into, into trends like the Oracle and Delphi, it's called, it's called something in English, that kind of uh, side. It's, uh, sometimes they use the word Sybil as well. Yeah, um, yeah, that, yeah. yeah. I don't think it is. I think a vulva is somebody who speaks reality and, and thereby creates reality. I think that's what the vulva does. I think narrative magic was super, super important for our ancestors. And I think we've lost track of that and are only focusing on, on the craft as something shamanistic. And I've never been on the shamanistic team of the vulva craft. I'm not speaking bad about them. It's just not what I, what I do and what I have been done. So I think a vulva is somebody who's, who says a spot on, how do you- yeah. Prophecy. A prophecy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that as a prophecy in the old times, it was not necessarily related to the, to the future. It could be about the past or the present too. And I think that's what I'm doing. And that's why the book is called Vulva. And that's why I call myself a vulva, even though I know it's controversial, but that's because I wanna, I wanna kick the, beehive a little bit around our understanding of witchcraft and magic and sight and uh, and the vulvas mm -hmm. well that sounds sounds fun because i think i think witchcraft has, has probably died amongst the everyday person um i think people who are outside of, of certainly of this community i um, you know i have i have friends outside of the viking sphere um, and you know, if I mentioned witchcraft to them, it would be, it, 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 it would be laughable. And that's um, maybe that you know might not be the kindest word, but that's what it would be. I think to people who aren't around this kind of thing often, um, and I think to the average kind of Joe, magic is now something that is unfortunately laughable or something that they don't consider or maybe don't even think exists or did exist. It, it, it's, so it's, it's kind of sad that that's that's where we're at but it's not like that here in Denmark it, like I am teaching witchcraft at a school right now so I, there's a whole other thing going on here with the witchcraft and the vulvas it's uh, it's not laughable at all like mainstream writers are writing about it it's being debated in, in newspapers it's 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 just different here I guess and I would say it's, it, yeah. it's a similar thing here in the U.S. There's a lot of uh, interest and popularity around witchcraft. Um, there's there's a lot of people, regular, normal people who do it. Um, I'm sure it's different from what it is in Denmark, of course. Um, a lot of it has to do with like crystal magic and that kind of stuff. So so that's that's probably an element that that's somewhat different. Um, <clears throat> but. I'd, I'd say that there, there's a lot of people who take it very seriously here too. Okay. Um, so do you think uh, that's just just the crowd that you're that you're in? I think it's very very much depends on where you're at and who you're talking to. Like the People's Republic of Boulder, as it is also known as, right? Uh, <laughs> this little this little bubble of of very left leaning and also you know. Uh, spiritually um, um, experimenting um, types of people. They're, of course, into that kind of stuff, just like they're into yoga and Hinduism and Buddhism and all those things, right? So you you get that, you know, in a place like, like, like Boulder. Um, you're not going to get that in, I don't know, a small town farther away out on the plains or something like that. So but that's, I think that's definitely the difference. Something is definitely hap happening here. I think a lot of people like also in relation to the climate crisis and stuff, they're embracing a more uh, animistic worldview. And I think a lot of us who, has, who have been working with this for 20 years, we're being called to 
step forth and try and be not laughable when we when we talk about it and i think maybe the context is different in america than from here because you know i've i've, I've published this book and it's it's uh, my latest book but but it's it's being you know i'm in tv shows and stuff about it so there is an like kind of a serious interest mm -hmm. into nordic animism at least here in denmark mm -hmm. yeah no i'm i'm sure and i think that is that is also growing here more and more people are getting into it and daniel might be you know i don't know hanging around with a very skeptical crowd <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think I probably am. Yeah, but that's that's so good. You stay skeptical and I stay weird. <laughs> oh, I'm still weird. <laughs> okay, weird skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, I I personally, I, I'm I'm usually quite happy to say I, I don't know things. I'm I, <clears throat> I'm certainly not one to profess that I know everything or much about anything. To be honest, I, I'm I'm quite happy to, to sit in the middle and say. I just don't know. I don't know. I don't know whether mm. things things exist or don't exist. And I'm quite happy to to be there and and learn as I go along. And maybe something will happen in my life that makes me believe one way or the other. But I'm comfortable in in not knowing. I guess mm. which I don't think I don't think enough people are happy in that position. It tends to be you have to go all in one way or the other. No, I don't think it is like that. I think that's what we have been indoctrinated to think. I, I believe in science and I'm a skeptical person too, but I can at the same time practice magic. That that monotheistic you know, way of thinking that we have to believe in one thing is deeply Christian. So I think what we can do as modern is to, moderns is to embrace, you know, many truths and, you know, like, like, you're skeptical that's fine and you're just looking around the world and that's fine it's not like anybody wants to uh, convince you of anything but you know that's just many truths i think mm -hmm. the way that i i like to talk about it is that uh it's not about belief or anything like that it's no. like, it's the, the question is whether or not you know some kind of gods or entities or supernatural beings or whatever they exist in your worldview like is it something you can use to talk about and you know talk meaningfully about to other people as well or 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 can't you or don't you right that that's the difference mm -hmm. so so that that's that's how i i like to sort of like uh phrase it in terms of like how it can exist along the because this idea that oh it's either religion or science yeah that, that's say, that's fake yeah. but are you how, yeah it, it feels like that's how everything is designed yeah. Now, whether it's the, the media or it's Facebook or it's Instagram, everything is designed to divide people and make you take one one view or the other. And there is no middle ground. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a sucker for getting into arguments on Facebook. And I know I shouldn't, but I just do because I enjoy it. I enjoy the mental chess. That's just something I do. But I've never, I've never once had one where it comes to the end and the person goes, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to change my opinion now. And and that's never happened because that is, I feel like that's not what we're we're trained to do. We 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 have kind of got into this way of you have to go think left or right, red or blue, and then you stick stick to your guns and that's it. And you you refuse to change your mind. It's almost as if changing your mind is a bad thing. Yeah, but that's what that's why it's needed to talk about uh, the old worldview and different ways of doing it. Are you familiar with Peter Gray and ap apocalyptic witchcraft? I am not. Okay, because what he's, it's a really, it's a great book. You should, you should read it. What he argues is that we are actually practicing magic in the same way as they did in the, in before times. Our priests are just economics who are telling us how things are. We don't understand, you know, economics in that great scale of whatever they call it. We don't understand that. We're just being told what to believe and then we believe it. So what we can do, I think, and what witchcraft has, has always done is, challenge that authority and and you know um trying to argue that there can be many truths indeed so that's that's what i think is is the most the most basic definition of witchcraft is opposition it's resistance to being put down into that very very n narrow way of thinking that you have to choose one truth that's just our modern you know religion 
Mm-hmm. If you look at it historically, actually, that is that is what witchcraft quite often has been. Some kind mm-hmm. of um, you, you know, a, a, yeah, subversive action. Um, for instance, like a, a great example is one of my favorite ones. This guy on a cemetery in the 1480s in 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 Sweden, who you know, I, I, he makes a pact with Odin so that he he can get more money, right? Like that's yeah. subversive right there. Some somebody's trying to go outside of the established ways in which uh, you you know make money in in medieval society, and he yeah. communes with an ancient spirit to do that. That's Odin. Um, and then he, um, well, he ends up, I think he got burned on the stake, but uh, <laughs> for a while there, I, I guess he was, he, he was rolling, <laughs> right? That's subversive action right there. It, it doesn't matter whether or not it works. It, what, what matters is that he is actually like sticking it to the man. <laughs> like that's, he's, yeah. he's flipping off and there's a lot of that society. In- yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of that in witchcraft and I think witchcraft is political and I think a lot of us, you know, modern, the left leaning, whatever it's called in English, progressive people, we have just kind of embraced technology and science in a kind of monotheistic way and forgotten that, you know, to be to be a rebel is, is always to is also to challenge your own thought patterns and to, you know, go out of what you think, you know, sometimes. Um, so I actually think like like you're debating online and you're doing the mental chess, that's all good and fine. But if you're staying within your own mindset all of the time, it's it's not really, uh, I think, um, spiritual or, or maybe helping the world. I think we need to expand how people think. That's I really do. And I think to the ancestors, you know, knew that and and we've forgotten. Mm-hmm. That's that's uh, my stance. Absolutely. But I I personally think debates are healthy. And that more people should yeah, me too. I debate like, I things. Debate. Um, yeah. I think it, it's yeah. sad that but it, some... it can be very lazy, you know, if you just do it the same way all the time. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I and think. especially if you start getting offensive or swearing, yeah. you know, it has to yeah. be respectful. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's, you know, we are, we, we are conditioned by sort of the, the social media platforms at the minute to just get stuck in stuck in a cycle and you you get these little echo chambers of things that you like and you're you've shown things that you like and you engage with so you don't people don't explore outside of what they know and their their worldview they don't discover new ideas i mean just through this podcast alone it's opened my eyes to so many different things that i would never have seen or spoken about before whether it's through kind of witchcraft and, and Volva or through the animism side with Rune. Um, all this kind of stuff is completely new to me because I, I grew up outside of this community. I, I didn't be, sort of enter into this world until I was maybe 20, 22, 23. Um, so I grew up as just a, a normal lad from Yorkshire, playing rugby, playing sport, running around, that kind of, kind of thing. And it, magic vikings and all this have never entered my, my mind until maybe like they like say i was 23 and then doing the podcast with the taste and speaking to all these amazing people which is why i said earlier that the, these kind of episodes are so interesting to me because there's just so much to learn and hear all these different opinions and and experiences and really try and take in whether i agree with them all or not it's still amazing to listen to and kind of get that perspective on life and how people look at things and hopefully people listening to this also get that i hope so too i think one of the things that is needed in the heathen community is that we begin talking about you know also the more personal stuff like you just did i think that was super touching and uh, i say this because again me and my team matthias have been arguing about this in the past right matthias so that's a For little years <laughs> to you <laughs> <laughs> we actually we were like dead enemies or something we were really really at each other for a long while but you know we got an older and and i think that's kind of beautiful also that we we meet in the middle perhaps thank you for inviting me <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> of course 
We meet in the middle for a proper Holmgang. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. <laughs> That's the thing. I think so many people refuse to refuse to do that. They, yeah. they, they, it's you either agree with me on everything or we're or nothing. Like we're not friends at all, or you agree with we have to agree on everything. It's not that people can't just go, okay, well, you think that, I think this. But everything else, we you know, we get on about everything else. So why? It, it, it it's so frustrating that people will. I mean, things like Brexit or the last presidential campaign in America between Trump and Biden, like those things, people will have. They're so polarizing that they was. I assume they will have split families apart. Um, but people, why aren't people able to go? Okay, you think that I think this, but we can still. You can still be friends. You can still get on. You can still love each other. You're allowed to have different opinions on some things. You don't have to agree on everything all the time. And it's just, it's unfortunate people seem to be moving away from being able to do that. I'm super inspired by the, like I don't know what it's called in English, but the oral fortelling tradition, the the oral tradition of storytelling. Yeah. Uh, and and my book is is uh, based on Velospa, like the prophecy of the Sirius. And we know that these stories have been told like from concrete bodies, like real bodies in real time and real spaces, people talking to each other, looking each other into the eyes. And I think like when we talk about heathenry, this sitting down around the fire is just super important. And we haven't had that online Online, we've had forums and, and Facebook groups and email lists where we could argue, but we 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 haven't had the opportunity to sit down like we're doing right now. And you're just talking about things that pops up, and I think that was was extremely important to our ancestors. And I think mm -hmm. it's, it's a, for me it's a political and a spiritual act to try and bring this tradition of of oral storytelling back. And I think we're doing it right now. I think mm -hmm. you know. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I, there's there's concrete science behind that too. What you're saying right there. I mean, we we know for a fact that people are you know dicks on social media because they're not sitting, looking into the eyes of another person, another human being, and having that personal interaction. Right? They, it's just in a name and and a little you know avatar or something like that, a picture of somebody. And we also know for a fact that places like Facebook, they uh, generate algorithms based, based off of uh, people arguing. And there's a performative aspect to writing uh, something on Facebook and then arguing with something you, 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 somewhere in the back of your mind, you do also have the knowledge that there are other people looking at that, right? So if you back down, right? Yeah. If you back down if you concede to the the other person's argument then then all of a sudden you might have shown weakness or you might be worried that you've shown weakness or something like that and so that's also part of making people being extra shitty on <laughs> on platforms. yeah they are but are i you... think like in our tradition being verbally or orally competent is like it's in layered in the myth and in in, in mm -hmm. this in the stories we are supposed to be really good rhetorically that's that's how reality is you know produced in in this religion it's like you know killing him i'm i'm with henning kua here you know i think it's the sound <laughs> um like killing that beast and and making words that's how we create the world the world is created through dialogue and debate that's what the gods do all the, the time they go to their chairs and they debate stuff mm -hmm. so we should do that as modern heathens but we have i feel we have gotten like this whole um computer thing took away that bodily aspect like you and me we have matthias we have when we have met in real life sitting around the fires or doing rituals together we have i said i said we're friends but online we have been like super super enemies and it just goes to show that that format is uh, something wrong with that and i think i really think it's our job as modern heathen heathens to try and, and bring that verbally articulation back I, I agree very it's very impersonal as well when you when it's online so it's easy to detach and not assess people's feelings and also body language is a huge a huge mm -hmm. aspect obviously even though we you know we do this over 
over Zoom, and it's it's still not the same as being sat with somebody in a room. You you we you know we're we're natural beings. We're made to pick up on the smallest mm-hmm. reads and tells, so you can figure out whether if you say something that's a little bit off, then you can correct it because you can read the body language and you can tell. You can even get a vibe or a feeling. You know these things exist. Whereas online, you don't get that. It's it's very literal, um, and it's easy to take things the wrong way and get upset. But keep also in mind here that we're actually guinea pigs, right? Oh yeah. We, we're 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 this all this technology is being tested out on us, mm-hmm. right? And then at some point, humanity will figure out how that works in the best way. And, and, and you know, a comparable example that I actually used in my witchcraft class uh, yesterday um is is the uh printing press when it was invented first thing it was used for was to talk shit about other people like you know producing propaganda pamphlets about um you know the the evil uh, romanians or or something like that that's how the myth about dracula was created in the first place you know those kinds of things like in, in the balkans and you know uh in the same way what what do what is the main way that the internet is being used for well aside from pornography i think it's it's talking shit about other people you know but i think i've I've been like really diving into this the the tradition of of oral storytelling and i think there's like three main components to what goes on around a myth being told or a sequence where people are sitting around a fire and it's it's always that there is a body there's a real body somewhere there's this you know embodiment and it's always in a con- concrete place it's a specific place and that place influences what is going on like right now we are on zoom and we all agree that that influences what is going on and the third thing that is like super defining for for how a story is being told is the time you know what time is this story being told in this book here let's see it it's uh, i really love it so i'm going to show it a lot but here on the on the black pages is i've um re um retold the original velospa stories and then here i have a chapter in a, a modern language about the themes in in that each verse of the velospa and that's because i think we are not in a time where people could go up and do poetry like that in like a single verse, just encapsulate everything. We're so extremely verbal in our time. So I needed to take a whole chapter to talk about the theme. So the time influences so much what is what is being told, but I, I do believe that storytelling is so integral to, to heathenry. And I think it's extremely overlooked. And I think, like witchcraft does have something to offer here because it's it is more embodied than the academic uh discourse Mm -hmm. yeah no i i agree with that um what is the primary expression of of non-dogmatic religions it's 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 storytelling it's myths right so so any any situation where you need to tell somebody uh some profound things about say ethics of 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 that particular culture and tradition you'll use a parable an exemplary story of some kind that lays out exactly uh, some kind of is typically some kind of you know ancient uh, event that then corresponds to the current situation right so mm-hmm. that makes perfect sense i guess they were they were used as a way to remember things and I assume stories were used to warn people of of things. Maybe don't eat a certain thing because obviously I, things weren't written down. So I assume all these little little tidbits of knowledge must have been hidden within stories that were told around the fire. Absolutely, but there's also sort of like a reproductive element to it. Like that, this is never old knowledge. It's always new. It's always. New yeah, and it's always changed and and modified to to certain situations, right? There's the practical aspect of like remembering that oh, over in that tree, there's like a you know certain you know, particular poisonous spider that likes to hang out in that type of tree. So let's keep that in mind in our stories, right? But then there's also all the things that have to do with the uh, the, the social structures of existence, right? So so 
you know, you might have a story about a tree that is inhabited by poisonous spiders of various kinds, but those poisonous spiders, they probably do something. They probably have some relationship to some other animal and something like that. And, and then the interactions with those animals then tells you something profound about the social and cultural reality of the population who likes to talk about that tree inhabited by poisonous spiders, right? Mm -hmm. So that's part of it too, like that the culture, nature, all these things come together in these stories and work together to create sort of like a total image of, of what these people, whoever they were, uh, think, right? But don't you think our stories on social media have become rather uniform? Oh, because detached from reality I too. I think that's, yeah, I think that's what ha what's happening right now is like for the first is super boring stories about a hate and polarization and it's the same stories all the time. It's just... Mm -hmm. No, it's true. And that, that, that's the same, again, going back to the printing press yeah. and the popularization yeah. of books, what happened? Pretty yeah. fucking boring Victorian yeah. stories over and over again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, And we're caught in the same loop. It's just different stories right now. And I wonder sometimes, how can I as a heathen kind of break out of that, that cycle of how we still tell stories in our in our day and age? And I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think, I just think that this thing of like talking like we do now, I think that is going to be more and more what's going to happen in the future. I don't think the book as such will survive for much longer. It is a, a dying art form in some ways, um, I think. That would be sad. You might be right about that. Yeah, it would, yeah, uh, it would be yeah. sad though. I, there's something about a book, something tangible about holding it, feeling it, I would say reading it, but I don't do very much of that. But but even then, though, I would even if I listen to a, a an audio book, I just, there's something about that I would still want to own that book. It's almost like a trophy of the I read this book, and here's my little trophy of it in a physical form that I can look at and put on my shelf. And it's it's very it's just there's something nice about it, and it would be sad to to lose that. Yeah, I feel the same way exactly. And I know as an author, I did this Vulva as an audiobook too. And it's like 28 hours of talking into a microphone. It was mm -hmm. really, really boring. Um, and people are streaming it, but I get like, you know, one corner per book where I would get, you know, well, a lot more for the physical book. So there's also a there's, there's also a question here about what's go, what is going to happen with the people who are telling stories in, in our time, because it's been so distributed that everybody is telling stories. And I love that. It's called, like in witchcraft, in the witchcraft community, it's called the democratization of, of witchcraft. Everybody is practicing it now. Everybody is defining it on, in, on their own, and, and I support that. But also, it's, uh, there's a sadness, too. Mm -hmm. I that happens with so much stuff though, doesn't it? Where it gets yeah. popular and so many people do it. But I think the, the quality usually always does still rise to the top, I guess, and you can find it if you if you want. Mm. Um, and I, I just quickly wanted to say about, you mentioned kind of how do you bring back storytelling? Um, and I think it would be almost impossible without having the digital kind of yeah. things there to use because... I assume you know back when the original stories were told, everybody in a in a small area believed in the kind of the same things, and you would they would all come and sit sit down around a fire. Whereas now, everybody who likes or or is interested in this community, we're, we're spread out all over the world. It's not it's not a case of I might within a, there might be like two of us within a, a five mile radius of my house who are into this kind of stuff. So it's much harder to get that physical mm -hmm. meeting place, I guess, or certainly. In England, maybe it would be different in the US or, or in Denmark, but over here, I, I think it would be much harder to get a good collection of people to meet physically. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So before, before like dissing social media to, to completely, we should talk about that the, the loneliness that we are experiencing, like an epidemic in our in our time, right? So, and and something is happening that is good, but. I mean, if I look back to the ancient traditions of, of storytelling, people would gather around and a vulva, perhaps, would tell a story and people would listen. Whereas now, 
if I want to work as a vulva, I can tell a story, but the people, they're not like, they're not sitting down, you know, they're just running around with things in their ears and listening to it, mm-hmm. listening to it halfway. So our attention span and our ability to like really focus is, is um, impaired, I think. And, and that is a challenge for a modern magic worker, for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And a modern teacher as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I, th- I think you. I, I know. <laughs> yeah, I think for everything, um, I think we also have to be careful of looking back backwards too much, thinking that we want to go try and make it like it was back then. And as as nice as that that would be, I don't think there is any going back. So I think we have to then look at what we have and try and adapt it and make it work in the modern day. And like you say, it has to be through people with earbuds in and, and you have to reach them that way um i don't know what the answer is but i think you we have to technology is here to stay it's not going anywhere so we have to try and use it for in in the best way possible i love that you say that because i remember one of the first articles i did in a in a major newspaper in in the, in denmark i they quoted me for saying my computer is my staff which is you know <laughs> But in a way it is, because what is a modern vulva? Is she somebody who dresses up like they did in the old days and speak gibberish? I don't think she is. She is somebody who needs to make herself um, act, act, actual, how's that said? Um, relevant. Relevant. Yeah, relevant. Uh, and she has to be in there, you know, in, in society, touching it and, and touching the stories and doing something. And, and, you know, I'm trying to do that. And and what happens is that good people like Matthias Norvi will call you a media whore, for instance. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, in our community, in our heathen community, there is something happening right now because some of us are being um, ex- exposed more than we were 20 years ago. And we are getting voices like Matthias also and, and some other people. Um, and that was a bad thing 20 years ago, you know, touching the mainstream or getting out into mainstream was a bad thing. And I think we need to really take it, like, look at that, look at why is it that we have the, this resistance about telling openly about our spiritual uh, practice or religious or magical practices. Why, where is that taboo coming from? And I think one of the things we need to do is like rebel against it because if we are to do magic, we have to, to do it where people are, you know, sitting in by ourselves dressed as Vikings, that's not gonna do anything. It's just stupid. But I really like you know, that. I really just like to sit in a corner dressed like a Viking. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I like it too. Well, we can do both. You know? but the interesting this is an interesting yeah. thing that you you touch on is basically yeah. what you're saying is that the, the only way that uh, heathenry and your perspective on the world is actually really relevant is if you bring it out there to people yeah right? i believe that i do mm-hmm. so i mean when i when i wrote my book on also true i i had a lot of problems doing that um my I biggest am- problem was that i didn't actually want to tell anybody about it <laughs> it's uh it's it's a, a weird uh, uh uncomfortable uh thing to be uh, for me at least to be to be public about your uh spiritual background or wh- whatever you want to call it um that, for so many reasons and i mean one of them is definitely, should it? no it shouldn't be but one, well, of, they, one of them i would say it. Yeah, right. You understand it because you 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 come from that uh, uh, group of people who are very skeptical about those kinds of things, right? The skepticals. Yeah, let's hear from the skepticals. <laughs> I, I I don't even think it's necessarily that. It co- I mean, I'm sure the, the people are skeptical, but I think it's also that they just don't think about it. They don't mix with people who who are involved in this this kind of world, whether it's Viking magic or any other type of of magic. They just don't exist or don't ever have to interact with it so they don't think about it so it kind of just doesn't exist so when it pops up it's it's something that's unusual and everyone kind of shies away or is scared of things that are, are unusual yeah right yeah, it's, it's weird <laughs> like yeah like, you're like this is weird yeah yeah and um, that that is what magic is supposed to be isn't it it's supposed to be weird and queer and strange and you know yeah comfortable so <clears throat> i try my best to be, to do to be that <laughs> actually <laughs> I, I, I suppose as well magic went through a very 
kind of negative press phase from Christianity and got pushed down as all as because I think as well people who don't understand this kind of stuff will think of magic as being evil that's there's something of those two kind of tie together in in like I guess like the lay person's sense I mean, um, there's, nah, actually originally uh Christianity was also very much about magic in different ways it's it's only oh, early it modern is. Christianity yeah, it is yeah. turning um, water to wine <laughs> Eating yeah. the flesh, eating the flesh of Christ. No, but also, also just like um, you know, what you had in the medieval period, it, it was more of like a a situation where you know older style of magic was just reinterpreted in a Christian context. Then later on, in 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 late medieval Christianity, that's where you see the rejection of magic and the invention of this idea of like witches in a coven with the devil and all that funky stuff that's that's not a you know that that's like a, a purely in christian invention based off of some some uh, elements that they've taken from pre-christian traditions and also folk traditions primarily from france really and <laughs> and then that's... synthesized that and then turned it into you know all that pentagram and 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 heavy metal stuff that uh, we get now and that, that's culture. what survived though isn't it if if yeah. you asked 99.9 percent .9 of people to draw a witch you're going to get a black hat a broomstick maybe a black cat a crooked nose a wart. But let's, let's talk about what that actually means though and also i would encourage you to uh, explore the hashtag insta witches and you will you will see modern interpretations that are super hot and sexy and not evil at all so yeah, something yeah. is changing in in the public discourse here it, it, don't it, don't worry i have been following you have been yeah <laughs> <laughs> also there's like sheer wow well it's fascinating <laughs> But, you know, all of the things that you are mentioning mentioning now, like the hat, for instance, that we know that there was this like um, kind of shamanistic hat wearing of uh, vulvas and in all a lot of European uh, cultures, there were pointy hats. That's mm -hmm. something that the cult leaders or cult ritualists would, would use. And that has just been, you know, uh, under a lot of years of propaganda and bad press, it has become like silly, pointy, stupid hats. But at, at one time, it meant something completely different, and that's what happened. Everything that, everything that we have here in Denmark, like the, a black cat, for instance, that means bad luck or evil, and it used to be like a good omen. Mm -hmm. That's everything has been turned upside down. Like the fairies and the elves have been made like super, super small, and they used to be giant spirits. So. You know, we've just been under propaganda and, and we need to detox our brains from that Absolutely. when we talk about magic, I yeah. think. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I have, a, I have a theory that money is the root of all evil. And I, <laughs> I think I think everything everything stems back to it in some way. Um, and I think... Communists. <laughs> no, but I think, <laughs> I think with, with the... Um, this image of the witch, I think it's so well known and so and people know it so well and have this this evil because it's become synonymous with with people who want to make money from it. So they throw this i this idea of a witch, yeah. of this this very it's the same image no matter what you want to sell. It's and everybody knows synonymously that's a witch. So then it gets put on cups and plates and books and hats and whatever else because people who like witches are going to buy this product with this little yeah, image on it. Yeah, but that's happening to heathenry too. We are being like co-opted by capitalism right now. It's becoming trendy and you have to look a specific way and talk a specific way and do things in a specific way. It's happening with heathenry and it's, it's happening with witchcraft. witchcraft. Have a certain think... haircut. You have to have a, have well... a... <laughs> undercut and braided long hair and yeah, and a, well, excuse me, a tattoo. And... Yeah. and the tattoos, yes, yeah. 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 Side of the head tattooed. Yeah. yeah. You're yeah. such a stereotype, Daniel. Not I, me, I actually am. <laughs> <laughs> the chest I feel is nice, I must say. It's a nice uh, chair you have there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> I am such a stereotype really when you look at me. <laughs> I am you, so that's fine. Yeah. No, it's, um so you what what is what would you say a vulva is in a modern sense um like i don't know if day to day is the right 
word? Like, how would a modern vulva act in modern day? Does that yeah, is that a silly and, question? Does that make sense? Yeah. It's a, it's a it's a perfectly valid question, and and I think that. I am doing the work of a vulva and there are many vulvas and they're doing it in their own different ways. And that, that's super good. I think when we talk about like site tradition and vulva tradition in heathenry, we have been very, very stereotypically placing it amongst shamanism and all the folklore traditions and stuff that has been kind of downplayed. And I'm, I, I respect the people who work with witchcraft and, and the vulva craft in a shamanistic setting. I think, you know, that's part of it. It's just not what I do. So I prefer to talk about what I do instead of saying, you know, in general terms of vulva is this and this and this, because there's, there's a lot of vulvas right now and, and that's perfectly fine. But I, I believe that, you know, expanding reality by or oh, oh, let me say it in another way, trying to expand reality by telling stories is, you know, the main thing I do. I, I'm trying to do that right now when I talk to you. I'm trying to expand your understanding of witchcraft and what a vulva does. And I do it when I write books or when I do media. Um, I, I think there's um, there's an element, as I said before, of narrative magic in, in uh, the heathen vulva craft that has been overlooked for a really long time and and that's what I work with and then you know in my personal life I'm a writer and a speech giver and a public debater I think it's called so <laughs> that's that's what I do but what 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 would make I guess what would make you evolve uh, like what I'm just trying to understand like what yeah. actions I guess would it would define you yeah. as a, a yeah i think because this is this is the controversy and this is what is uh, this is what really i think um exposes our cultural um, problems <laughs> with talking about witchcraft and, and magic right now because i know that a lot of people find it super provoking that i say that i'm a vulva why is that why is that super provoking to say because it's a state of a, it's kind of like a, it's a, it's authority. It's, it's like people think if you're a vulva, you have some sort of authority. And they always ask, who made you that authority? You can't make yourself an authority in this culture. But, you know, maybe they could in, an, in, a, in a different culture. I, I really hate that modest, oh, I'm not a shaman. I, I don't call myself a shaman, but I am a shaman discourse that we find in a lot of new age uh, communities and I think a vulva in in the heathen days and I'm not saying we should go back but I don't think a vulva in the heathen days would be like oh I don't know if I'm a vulva I don't know what the others say a vulva is somebody who says yeah fuck yeah that's what I'm doing I'm you know and I'm not better than you because I have that authority it's just that's my work and you have other work um so I I just think it's so fascinating why I don't know if that's what you were you know asking about at all <laughs> but, uh, i'm sorry it, i'm going on a rant right now i just think it's super super fascinating why it's so provocative why is it so provocative to be a vulva or to call yourself a vulva we have a great debate about that in denmark right now it's and it is a very provocative the book is called vulva and that in itself is you know provocative that's the first thing I want to say on my super long rant here. I have a second thing. All right. Is that okay? Of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go okay. on. <laughs> Is that okay? Ask the little bit. No, but I, I also think that this whole, um, well, I, f I forgot it now, actually. <laughs> so, what? Okay, so. Well, I do I'm that all the time. To, yeah, sorry. <laughs> to hear more about, like, what are the positions here? Yeah. Is, so this is like a, a debate that, is there in Denmark? Is it elsewhere in the world? And also, like, what what do people like? What stances do people take on on the subject of somebody calling themselves a vulva? Yeah, and the thing is that we don't have any we don't have any elders to tell us, you know, what makes a vulva? How is she initiated? Who made her a vulva? So we have to, like I said in the beginning, Matthias, that's what we did twenty years ago. We talked about this stuff. We we, we don't know. So mm -hmm. it is, you know, a reconstructed spiritual path, and there's a lot of things that we don't know about 
what what a vulva is and how she works but what we did 20 years ago was we we made this ritual of initiation which Matthias participated in and I wrote about in my book and and then I I actually wrote this book where each as I said each chapter is based on a verse of Villaspa and it took me six years and I went like seriously crazy I was hospitalized uh, with craziness um so you know I, th I consider that my self-initiation and that's why I now call myself a vulva kind of almost without shame. I want, I want to really, you know, I want to highlight why it is so dangerous in our culture for a woman to have authority in magic. You know, I, I'm also a feminist, so there's that. So, okay, so, so, so the initiation here yeah. Is is this long process Let's of coming to yeah. to knowledge? It's being eaten by the wolf, you know. That's what it is in Norse mythology. It's a little what's what's it called in English? Wolf head. Red little red riding hood. Le, little red riding hood. It's the same basic theme that we see in a lot of the myths. For a female initiation to uh, take place in the Norse, as I understand it, in the Norse worldview, the the, the woman has to be eaten by the wolf. And in my case, that was schizophrenia. Uh, and, and for other people, it's fear or whatever. There is danger and you have to be consumed by den danger and you have to be eaten by your own fear and you have to um, fight your way out of that. And, and that is, you know, in basic in all initiations all over the world, this is a theme. And of course, it is in the Norse pan worldview, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're, you, it's not you're pretty, you know, it's, it's no. not a pretty thing standing with some firelights in, a, in, a, in the woods. It has to be ugly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're isolated from uh, safety, from society. Uh, yeah, you're, you're three, put out, yeah, yeah. it's Iliel. It's mm -hmm. a, it's these uh, three steps, you know, of every initiation. Mm -hmm. Being mm -hmm. isolating from the group. Then there is the liminal phase where you, where you, you know this, Matthias, uh, and the post-liminal phase. And this, this theory about this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, there are plenty of, <laughs> of theories. Yeah, no, yeah. Uh, okay, that makes perfect sense um, to me at least. What about you, Dan? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 it does. It does. Um, I try to hopefully just pull it back to kind of hopefully what I was getting at before. Um, and I, I was just trying to work out, I guess, this, I guess, the specifics of what would make you a vulva. Like when you go, you know, you say you went through the, the initiation, when you come out the other side, what's, I guess, what's different or what. I know you can only speak about your own personal experience, but I, like I say, I'm just I'm trying to work out the specifics of the difference between you and just an ordinary lady. If that makes does that make sense? I I hope it's not <laughs> yeah. coming across in any way offensive. I'm no. just I'm I'm trying oh, to figure out the specifics. Of it. Is it because you practice magic, or I know when we had Tanya on, she said she goes into like a a different realm almost and and can see the past. And, and the future and see all these different things whereas at that kind of uh, made sense in, in a sense of that she felt she was going into like a, a different world almost and, and was seeing, seeing things whereas I was wondering if that was the same for you or is yours a different kind of experience um, is it just I know I I'm rambling that, I think that the way I usually describe it is I was diagnosed with schizophrenia when I was 20 years old. And that is a really shitty diagnosis to get. And um, I see, I hear voices and I see things that other people don't see. And I'm just generally strange. And when I was 20 years, that was super, super bad. And it had to be, you know, cured. And I had to, it has, I have to be healed and I had to get a lot of pills and it was wrong. But the same object, objective experience of seeing something that is not there is in one language, the psychiatric language, wrong and has to be stopped. And in another language, the spiritual language, it's a competence, you know, it's a it's something that is actually like, like my talent. And obviously, okay. I prefer that that story of me being super special and a vulva 
of course I do that. It's a, it's a much better story than me being sick and not being able to function at all. So there's two conflicting stories here. And then I think the challenge is to not say, oh, I'm just like a super vulva because that would be stupid. There has to be, you have to acknowledge that there are many stories about the same objective phenomenon. So I think I'm both crazy and a vulva. And in this, in this society, what I experience, we have no language for it in, in a, an everyday setting. I have to be either crazy or work with magic because it cannot be allowed in our you know, everyday discourse. And, and that's, that sucks for me. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people who experience things like me, but also for our worldview, because there's a lot of things in our current language, you know, that, that there's a lot of things that can't be in this language of everyday life experiences and feelings and stuff that is there in the world, but it's not allowed in our shared language. And I think what the Vilva then has to do is to go to these dark places and being eaten by the wolf and do a lot of Uzzelninger and do strange things. And her task is then to kind of bring that knowledge into the shared language. That's what I think is the main job of a vulva. I don't think it is doing trance or oracle stuff. I, I do that too, or healing or plants magic. I do that too, and I think it's important, but the vulva, I think the specific Norse vulva, her job is to take that those things outside of language and, and kind of try and get them into our language. That's that's a perfect answer. That that's that's what I was looking for, was just that kind of understanding of that. And and I think that's really interesting. You 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 mentioned the, the schizophrenia because I I guess I always wonder things that because I guess throughout human history things that people don't understand or things that quote unquote the mass or the normal or isn't normal the, and things that people are scared of get pushed to one side and label as, as crazy or ill or something wrong with it and yeah. they kind of just get put over there and you you take these pills and be quiet and and you're just different and and that's kind of the way that it's been for for a long time but who is anybody to actually say what's happening with with that person it's easy for i guess for for somebody to for a doctor from the outside to label it as a certain thing but nobody can ever experience what somebody else is experiencing um it's it's a personal thing no you know the way that i see things or the way i, I experience it somebody could experience the exact same event but we both still have different experiences of the same thing that's happened it's it's, it's personal and nobody can ever tell you what it is or isn't um so I, I always wonder kind of what what these things could be or might be that just get labeled medically as as one thing, mm. but to that person in their own experience, it nobody can tell them what they've seen. It, it, you know, if, if you oh. say you if you say that you've seen the past, it's mm. the doctor can say one thing, but to you, if that's what you've seen, that's what you've seen. Nobody yeah. can tell you otherwise. No, but there is, there is, you know, there is a common language as, uh, and a common re shared reality that we have to, you know, participate in. And, and the problem is in our Western culture, I think our shared reality have become so narrow that a lot of things that, for instance, people in other cultures like schizophrenia doesn't exist in other cultures than the Western. So it's, you know, there's a lot of things that are not allowed in our in our shared consciousness, and it's just being labeled dark or evil, just as the witches. But it's there, you know. I am an animist. I do believe in spirits. I, they are there. It's it's my total reality, and and you know, I would argue that oh yeah, reality is bigger than our shared consciousness or our shared language right now because it's so so narrow. Mm -hmm. I I agree uh, a lot with that and. You know, it's our shared reality has been come, become pretty boring lately. It has, it has. <laughs> um, and if if we go back to the subject of witches, uh, one of the things that you can see when you look into a lot of the trials, especially in Scandinavia and especially in Norway, actually, a lot of the things you can see on on uh, if the details about like accusations of like why this person is a witch and so on, it quite often actually looks like a mental issue 
Yeah. Like some somebody who, for instance, is accused of like not backing down in in arguments and then you know escalating arguments because they get angry and and uh, those kinds of things. That's that that's a very common phenomenon in 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 the Nordic witchcraft trials. So, so it makes perfect sense too uh, from that perspective. Uh, basically, what what the normal society tries to do and has been doing since. Uh, I mean, the witchcraft trials as, as a cultural phenomenon in Europe are really part of a general atmosphere of regulating the population and trying to, to make especially the peasantry fall in line with the commonly held ideas among the elites. Uh, so it's part of like rooting out what uh, the church would also call superstition, for instance, and so on. But aside from that, also just like generally just regulating anybody who would be different. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think so that's the that's the that's the real problem here of the modern society, modern society um, that was founded on those ideas and principles back in the 16 and 1700s has really gone to that extreme of the, just trying to make everything as boring as possible. And that's why, you know, if, if you do suffer uh, from a mental illness, you don't have to suffer from it, but if you have one, uh, then, you, you know, you have a doctor who medicates you so that you become docile and can go sit in the corner and not be a nuisance to anybody, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I think we also have to be, be careful just to point out that there are some people who, get mental health treatments that are very much a success story that go from yeah. from not being able to maybe function in society to having help and then being kind of i guess quote unquote more stable and fun functioning better and it helps them so we, we you know it's not we can't just kind of say no no but i'm not everybody no no absolutely not i'm just kind of okay covering yeah my, my covering all your bases <laughs> no, yeah it, it, it's, it's a complex yeah it's a complicated yeah. situation isn't it, it it's is. it's we don't know everything and some people just should be left alone and some people genuinely do need help um so it's kind of finding that that balance and, but and i hopefully... think there is a percentage of, yeah yeah i just think there's a percentage of the things that we categorize as as mental health issues that are in fact perhaps not mental health issues, but there is mental health sickness. It does exist, and and of course that that's you know, and and that's we need to talk about that. And you are absolutely right. I'm not saying that if you're crazy, it's just because you are vulva, you know, and go do magic. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying that for some of us who experience reality very different from you know normality, it's very easy to be categorized as mentally sick mm. mentally whatever it's called you know and, and that happens for a lot of the people who works with witch, witchcraft and magic in modern day we're talking modern witchcraft and vulva also I, now. yeah I, I i my personal opinion is i think that pretty much everybody has some form of mental i don't even think it's i don't i don't even want to call it like a mental health issue because i just think it's just normal it's just life everybody gets anxious everybody feels scared everybody worries about things everybody feels down depressed it's just some people bury it and hide it and it never rears its ugly head but it may come up 10 years down the line and all come out at once or some people deal with it in a certain way that they manage it every day i i, I think this this stigma of it of it being like some people having some people don't needs to kind of end because i just think yeah. i think people need to be more honest everybody i i get anxious about a lot of things and scared and worried and some days I just, I, I feel down and depressed. I think it's just human nature. I think it's how, how we are. We can't have this preppy little smile and be perfect and happy all the time. And I think we do, we do ourselves a travesty by trying to pretend that, that oh, most people are and you people who aren't, there's, there's something wrong with you because that's just, just bullshit. Yeah, but yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I don't think this, like this subject is, is, a way that we can talk about this subject is to talk about how was this being handled? How did we handle st stuff as a culture in a, in a pre-Christian times in, in Scandinavia? And one of the things I have found is that in the Villospa, for instance, there are, there are like a lot of um, rituals and, and myths that are myths. It's the S when I speak English that is so difficult for me. The myths 
of uh, yes. pre-Christian yes. times. There's, there's this uh, idea of being eaten by the wolf or consumed by fear. I have anxiety too. And I did a ritual um, for, for one of the verses where I went into a, a root cellar, which is something we have here. It's just underground stones. And I was doing a trans ritual and I <clears throat> discovered that I had actually entered, <laughs> this is a scary story now, uh, I had entered a colony of grave spiders, like the colony of, uh, no, uh, great spiders, what are the, um, Grotte Edderkopper. Um, hmm. Cave spiders, it was a colony of cave spiders, they're really big spiders. And I was sitting there and I was surrounded by, by these, this colony of spiders. And I was so, so, so afraid. And I was like, I was freaking out. And then I realized during that ritual that in heathenry, there is, I believe, a very big element of fear. It is fear. It is allowing yourself to feel fear instead of trying to, you know, not feel fear. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, there's, there's knowledge here, you know, I'm, I can go deeper into it, but I just had this giant revelation that heathenry is fear. And what what you know industrialization took from us is fear and and all of the normal human feelings and we were not supposed to feel that we were supposed to feel happy and all the time you know super productive all the time and that's not human existence so i think a lot of the myths of ancient times they actually have wisdoms that we can use in relation to mental health issues now that's why we're talking i think yeah, I think yeah. people, as silly as it sounds, people are scared to be scared of things or yeah. fear yeah. things when it doesn't yeah. have to be like you can embrace and enjoy yeah. fear. It doesn't have to always be a negative thing. Um, I don't know if any of either of you have ever seen the documentary about the gentleman who free climbed El Capitan in. Yeah, the, I did. Yeah, um, yeah. A guy called Alex Honnold and he. Yeah. He free climbed El Capitan, the first person to ever do it without a rope, without anything. Um, and, and he embraced the fear. And, he, and his argument was people were like, you know, what if you slip? What if you make a mistake? And he was like, look, if I'm climbing free, free solo, then I won't make a mistake. There won't be a mistake because I can't make a mistake. It's, it's life or death. And, it's, and you get on into that zone where he, you can't afford to do it. So you just don't do it. Your body knows not to not to make mistakes and I, and you know some people things happen where you know, they get hurt but um it's that embracing the the fear and using it it doesn't always have to be this huge mm. negative thing that consumes you you can use it to to drive you as well mm. and i think there's a lot of that in the nordic myths there's a lot of fear and weird creatures and and you know spooky things and and it's it's there for a reason i think mm -hmm. I mean, are you, are you calling the Vikings scaredy cats? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of lot of Viking bros yeah, out there yeah. that's gonna get mad now. <laughs> oh, I mean, this idea that that they were just super brave, hyper masculine yeah. warriors with giant beards, six, no. you know, six foot five. Like it's it's ev everybody is scared of things. Like yeah, that whole... you go through it, you know, you go through it and that's the point. And, you, and one of the ways you go through it, if you, if you look at the myths, there's this community and there is, you know, sitting down, talking together. There's this concept of frith and, you know, peace. And it's just, you know, why are we pretending to, to like fight each other on some intellectual level when we could just like sit and, and you know, hang out? Yeah. <laughs> fear, fear is very much just a human emotion yeah. every every friday evening i go sparring mm. i go mma sparring so mm. it's for, for an hour and a half i've got somebody trying to punch me in the face that's that's how it is but i'm also trying to punch him and i i, I don't mind admitting that i'm terrified every time i go every time i go i'm like what if someone kicks me in the head yeah. like it's it's a it is a very much a thing i still do it because i enjoy it and i get a thrill out of it but if i if i if i went into that situation with somebody who's trying to take my head off and i wasn't scared i would be more worried yeah. than actually being fearful because it's just natural we are we're meant to be scared of things and to yeah. pretend that we're not is just silly 
Yeah, but this time. whole culture is but is is like built upon try that we should not feel fear or, or boredom or you know emotions at all. So you know, yeah, you're saying something, Matthias. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that, that that time I had to run from a moose, I I definitely also felt fear. <laughs> that you run faster as well. You were well, being I mean, in, in. It was an initiation, you know, Matthias. <laughs> totally. An initiation. Didn't realize at the moment, but it was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no yeah. that that was uh yeah that 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 um that was definitely a moment of feeling fear right and utilizing that fear um then you know helped me also not get trampled by that moose so that was yeah. that was that was nice i bet there was something extremely exhilarating when you when you got to safety um that feeling of relief oh yeah I get, yeah, yeah. Oh, it, but it's also excitement it's adrenaline mm -hmm. there is very much like a chemical reaction in your body that happens that makes you feel it, you, you feel amazing once you kind of escape death i guess which is why people base jump climb up mountains fucking without a rope and yeah, that's just insane though <laughs> i wouldn't want to do that oh it's it, that, it is a I think the documentary is called free solo and it is it's brilliant i mean we have these people around all the time like i live in the mountains you know <laughs> like they're they're everywhere oh we i have sweaty palms just watching the fucking thing we have about like i don't know an average of three deaths per year of like climbers who just fall off shit in, oh, yeah. in, in my neighborhood <laughs> I, I assume that for every alex honnold who successfully climbs free solo up El Capitan, there is a fucking hundred others that don't <laughs> probably yeah <laughs> like I, he's i imagine he's a he's a certain type of human to be able to do it mm. yeah no um andrea um yeah. we uh promised that we also wanted to talk a little bit about um environmentalism and climate yeah change. i was just thinking about it right now because fear right mm -hmm. that's that's somewhere where where we should feel fear and and not docile or you know everything's going to be okay ish that's that's an issue where we should actually feel fear i i believe and i think the concept of raunerog is is uh, there's so many things to say about that and i and i know matthias you have done that and, and can do that but i think in in on this topic of fear that concept is really helpful too because what happens when the gods know that everything is gonna go to shit and the whole their whole world will collapse and die they ride into battle and and they fight knowing that they will die and that's what i think is one of the hardest topics to talk about in in environmentalism right now and i i am a, a climate activist and, a, and a, i'm very involved in that you know and everybody wants hope everybody wants to not feel fear because that's what our modern culture has taught us that's how we deal with shit in this civilization but if you look to the ancestors they had this concept of raunerok as um, as something terrible that you just had to ride into you had to have that battle and 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 you die mm -hmm. and then how how can we as a culture who was so has so many issues with death how can we even begin to understand that you know riding to to death willingly that's i can't understand it but i'm 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 working around it using that metaphor of uh, of raunerok mm -hmm. yeah no the the climate is definitely a, a hot topic mm. at the minute um obviously we have cop 26 going on over here and uh, it is it's it's a it's an extremely scary kind of situation because personally, I uh, I think unless the people at the top uh, decide they want to do something about it, then you know people like us can do our our little bit. But I think it's going to have very little impact unless the people who own the the giant fam the giant companies, um, unless they're willing to do something about it, like the fuckers cutting down the rainforests, um, mm. then I think we are fighting a dying battle almost like Ragnarok because it's there's, there's just so many people who just cause so much of, of what's going on um just like the, the the upper elite who just i don't think give a fuck 
because they get their little bit and their their extra million pound, billion pound. <clears throat> I mean, what we're dealing with is uh, so the story about Ragnarok and how we can use it in this context is, of course, to not feel despair when we're facing these issues, right? Like we, we're not going to to fold and and uh, just feel like uh, this is an insurmountable task. There's nothing we can do about it. Uh, we're just fucked, right? Um, and instead, say, look, let's uh, let's try to fix the issues. And um, speaking to that uh, topic of uh, of those people in charge, right? I mean, they need to get on that shit. Mm -hmm. Stop bitching and bullshitting and fucking around because they're full of shit, and we know it. Yeah, they, like, it's, we, it's, we've known this since the seventies. Actually, I mean, they're, they're like, what is it? there's like this interesting newspaper article from like new zealand in 1911 or 10 or something like that where, where <laughs> they're just like noting that oh yeah uh now the the furnaces that are burning around the factories in the world have caused an increase in in, in global heat and it's like that's over 100 years ago we've known this for a while but now, i think right? i i think what i understand what you're saying and i hate the elite too and eat the rich and all that i'm, I'm totally on that <laughs> bandwagon but i think there is um there's an element of individualism in the north mythos that we can use here because i don't think they have the power i think i have the power that's not the same as saying that if we all go be good consumers we can save the world i don't believe that that's bullshit also but I, I really think that apathy um, is, is, a, is, a, is being used against us right now to make us, to make us feel that, like we can't do anything. I, I look at the super rich sometimes and I think they're like our modern day dragons. They have hoarded all of the wealth and they're somewhere, you know, sitting on the gold and sucking out the life force of everyone around them. But, you know, you have to slay the dragons. It's not like... It's impossible. We have so many stories about that. So that whole, um, you know, uh, yeah. The I just want to clear up with what I said before. That doesn't mean I, I don't think that the, the grass grassroots level people shouldn't do anything. Uh -huh. I think that as a, as a collective, we we have to force the people at the top to change. And yeah. the I don't think you do it by pulling at the heartstrings of the environment i think you do it at the only thing that they care about and that is where you're spending your money um i think if, if, if enough people change their spending habits um then you can force the big companies to change how they operate because you're not willing to buy their products or you're not I willing to do the things that they want to do and that's the only language that they those people would understand and that kind of goes back to what i said earlier about the money yeah, but that's one thing you can do, but that's not the only thing we can do. We can live honorable lives, you know. We can be, we can, ha, we can be heroes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, this is like that. I hate that. Not what you're saying now, but I, I hate it when the culture tells me that the only way I can change things is by, you know, recycle stuff or, or buy ecological. It's just like no, I want to fight this. I want to. No, I want to ride into battle on this issue. And I think that's what be, what has been lacking in the environmental um, discourse or, or in, the, in those communities and in the way we talk about uh, the climate crisis as, as such. It's just like a, it's become super boring and it's the same stories being repeated again and again and again. And it doesn't help. And so how do we hack that? How do we hack that story? That's what I'm interested in, and I have I haven't got an answer. But no, I, I don't really know either because it's also you, you you see it all the time. It's one story for yeah for the elite and one story for for everybody else. I mean, like say you have the whole COP COP twenty six, and they had two hundred leaders from two hundred countries who all flew into to Glasgow for this for this meeting, and they stayed there for two days and flew back. You know, Biden flew in on his private jet Air Force One, had an eighteen car motorcade to get to the event then went back two days later and think, well, how can you come into a, to a climate change event in that way, using the amount of fuel that you did just to get there, stay for two days and then, and then leave. And how many, it was not, it's not just president Biden. It's, it's all 200 of those people who've gone there. Even Boris Johnson flew from London to, 
to Glasgow because he had to get back in time for a meeting because he didn't have time to get the train. So it's like it's you people see that and it's like, well, if they're fucking not doing it, why should I? And that's unfortunately how so many people react because they see the people at the top doing it. It's like, well, they get to enjoy their lives. They get to fly around the country. They get to, and they're, they're wealthy enough to do it. So why should I struggle more than I already am doing? Yeah, but that's, it's a super, it's a bad story. That's why we have to change it. Before I wrote this book, I wrote a book about how my family and I, four children and my ex-husband, when we ran away from society into the Swedish wilderness and built our own log cabin and lived there for eight years, like super, super primitive to get away from the machine. You know, that's, that's what we did. And when I wrote that book, it's been eight, it was in 2013. I was called a, a landsfarader, a traitor to my country, and I was called a, a climate terrorist. That was like, you know, in newspapers. And stuff has changed since then because we are we're working with the narrative of the culture. More people now are talking about nature in a different way than they did in two, 2013. Wait, so wait, they, wait, 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 wait. You yeah. moved to the woods in Sweden and then a bunch of Danes called you a traitor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that, isn't that hilarious? Yeah. There was, there was this guy even at a at a I had a I did a speaking and, and he just got up and went out and called me a traitor to my country. <laughs> what the fuck? It's eight years ago or something. It's it's not that long ago. And now everybody's like, yeah, I want to live in the forest in a log cabin, you know, things have changed. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the stories that I think we forget when we talk about environmental issues. Things have changed. I'm yeah. I'm not a catastrophist, but I'm not not uh, an anti-catastrophist either. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think e- even yeah. in, my, in my in my lifetime, 15 years ago when I was you know in high school, if if somebody spoke about the environment, they were kind of automatically labeled a hippie. That was the the go to. Whereas now that's not the case. It's it, there definitely is a change in yeah. in opinions. Um, and it's becoming more normalized to be able to speak about about these things, which is nice. Yeah. Um, I also th- I I think that the way that activists go about things have to be in a certain yeah. way, though, because I don't know whether you you two ever see the insular Britain people who go yeah. there that they're, they're a group of people and they and they. They want yeah. the government to basically insulate houses, which in in itself is a, is a perfectly acceptable request. It's a it's a good request. I don't think anybody would deny that it, it's a positive thing to, to do. But these people decide to block major roads, glue themselves to the floor, and disrupt kind of like the everyday person, um, prevent people from getting to hospital appointments, prevent people from getting to work. And I think when you when you go that extreme, that you lose the public. And I think yeah. the public has to be on side with these issues because that's how you're going to get the change. I think when you upset the public, you, you automatically lose credibility for your cause because oh, you... But this, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. No, this, no. Is, this is so interesting because, because also change like have been in, in gestated by the really, really radical people. You have to have somebody like really radical doing really, really radical stuff that everybody can agree on is super radical and it's too much. But then you begin talking about it. We saw it in the Me Too movement also, right? There's some super radical feminists saying super radical things, but then slowly the stories like, you know, they, they come out into reality. And I think this is kind of like, this is narrative magic. This is actual magic being done. Somebody says something extreme and then the, the story just, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know how to say it in English, but I hope you know what I mean. No, I do. I do. Should we, should we wrap this one up? I think we're, we're at an hour and a half. We've got our Vikings watch along to, to watch after this. Um, Just a quick disclaimer. I'm a fucking idiot. So don't ever listen to anything that I say and take the advice that I say on this podcast. I know nothing about the environment. Um, so we're just... I think we're you just... do. I think you, you have a very... <laughs> I think you say... We're, <laughs> we're just talking. Please don't take any of my advice as being uh, legit, I guess. <laughs>
Well, we're all idiots, my friend. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say that. mean that we think. don't have uh, reasonable things to say from time to time. <laughs> no, I just don't want anyone to uh, do something and be like, oh, Dan said it was all right. <laughs> I think well, he, I think you should just say stuff and 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 have trust that what you say is meaningful and people want to hear it. I, I think it's really good with your. It's been good to hear your perspective during this conversation. Thank you. See? There's one person. Yeah. <laughs> but again, see, this is again down to confidence things. You know, um, going back to the whole mental health side of things. It's, yeah, exactly. It, it comes back to to having that confidence in yourself. You know. Hmm. I kind of just fell into doing this podcast with Mateus and um, I, I did want to say earlier and I forgot to mention it about how conversation kind of dies. And I think we mentioned on an earlier podcast before how I've got so much better at having a conversation and just listening to people mm. than before we did this, because mm. we, in my, in my everyday life, we just didn't have conversations. You didn't sit down for an hour and talk. Mm. But okay, so let me finish by saying that I think what you do right now is magic. I think this kind of work is magic. And I think it's extremely important. And I think you were good at doing it. And also you, Matthias. But I would like to fight with you again, though, Matthias. We will have to uh, next time I'm in Denmark, we'll have to yeah. sit, sit by a fire and, and, yeah. and fight about things. Yeah, I miss it. I really do. We can can yeah. we record it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'll, like I'll come to Denmark and we'll record yeah, it. Yeah, do that. That would be nice. That would be good fun. I'll tell you what the real magic is. A shout out to Shan and his editing skills of making us sound yeah. good, high quality and getting it to the world. That's the real magic because I don't know how the fuck that happens. I the just poor beat it guy like who <laughs> Yeah, he's I mean he's working his magic on my squeaky chair and stuff like that. <laughs> I just speak into a microphone and somehow it ends up that thousands of people can listen to it in two days time. So that's, <laughs> he's the real magician. <laughs> there you go, Shan. Don't say, don't say I never say anything nice to you. Mm. And don't give me a chipmunk voice again, you bastard. <laughs> 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 All right. um, Andrea, do you want to let people where, know where they can find your book, follow you? Yeah. Thank you for asking that. Um, no, it's not been translated yet. It's in Danish, but you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. I'm occasionally there. Um, so that's that. It's, it's a very Danish thing, this book so far. Yeah. Is there plans to translate to, to English? No, because, for... uh, no, no, I haven't. My last book has been translated to English, but that's because one of my reader uh, readers sat down and translated it. I'm a... Um, I'm publishing with Indie Publishing House. So if somebody wants to translate 600 pages. So it's, it, a you know, book. <laughs> it's a big book. It's a brick, yeah. No, but I'm, I'm on social media. So, but it's been really nice to be here. And thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, and thank you welcome. for joining us. Matthias, where can people find you? You can find me on Instagram or in the woods. There you go. Uh, you can you find me Daniel and Scott Aaron one or at Horns of Odin. Um, obviously you can follow the podcast at Non Mythology Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, the website Non Mythology Podcast uh, If you want to support a little bit further, Patreon is always the the best way. Um, it's just Patreon forward slash Non Mythology Podcast. Um, for every level you get to sit in and watch the live shows, you can join in on the live chat and engage with us whilst we're we're doing the episode and we'll, we'll kind of answer some questions as we go along. We, you can also get a bonus episode every week. It's either the Viking Watch Long Show where me and Matea sit down and watch an episode of Vikings and let you know our opinion or our story time episode where Jonas Lorenzen comes in and lovely, 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 wonderfully, <laughs> wonderful, wonderfully narrates the uh, the saga, the Volsunga saga we're doing at the minute. Um, and also, if, if you enjoy the show, please leave us a five-star rating and a positive review. I think that's everything. Okay. You can't so good at that. I know. <laughs> well, you know, I've done it enough times now, haven't I? Stop saying nice things about me. I'm going to blush. <laughs> blush, blush, blush. <laughs> I've got the same colour as this lovely chair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Andrea, thank you very much. Um, you're welcome back anytime. We can, we can do this again. I, I really do enjoy these deep talks. They may not be the most historical kind of factual episodes, 
but it's just fun to to air opinions on this stuff and, and really kind of listen and speak and yeah they're they're really fun for me i i enjoy them me too